Uh, welcome, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us. If you're joining us live or, or if you're listening after the fact, um, we're here on 29th of April 2021, recording episode 92 of Podchat Live, and we're super excited that, that uh, Dr. Doug Ritchie has joined us. Thanks for joining us, Doug. My pleasure. Uh, he is, it's a, tonight's topic of conversation is uh, his, the eponymous Ritchie Brace, which you may well be already prescribing, you may well be very familiar with, you may have heard of it, uh, but you've never really dipped your toes in those waters, uh, or you may have never heard of it before. So we're going to sort of start at the beginning and, and give people the whole the whole package of, 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 it, of information. And if you are watching and you've got any questions for Doug or comments, uh, please fire away and C Craig will bring them in at the uh, appropriate time. Uh, so by way of looking rather uh, prepared, which is rare for me, I know, a few facts uh, about the Ritchie Brace before we ask Doug to to uh, give us some of his, his, his insight on it. Um, it is its 25th uh, anniversary. It was first prescribed uh, by one lab in the US in Illinois in 1996. Um, and I believe at that time there were fewer than 500 AFOs per year being prescribed in, in the US. Uh, fast forward 10 years on from there, uh, and by 2006, there were 30,000 AFOs being prescribed per year. Now, of course, not all of those were Ritchie braces, but I think we shouldn't sleep on what a catalyst and what a part of that 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 surge um, the Ritchie brace probably was. And it's now available in, in seven countries, including the UK and including Australia. So the first question we should probably start with, Doug, is just how enormous is your house? No, no, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> Could do, would you uh, would you be kind enough to take us back to the years just prior to 1996? Because obviously, if that's when it was first prescribed, we all know that there would have been many years of of heartache and thought process and prototype that you were going through, probably early 90s uh, up into mid 90s. Do you mind just giving us an insight into where your head was at with with this in general, with what you were trying to achieve? Was it was it a a sort of uh, general unhappiness with the way AFOs at the time were, what, what sort of led you to this invention? Yes, um, at that time, uh, I was in private practice. My practice in California focused heavily on sports medicine. And so as a result, I was treating a lot of ankle sprains and uh, ankle injuries. And I would often use the popular uh, air cast or air stirrup brace as a remedy uh, or an immobilization for these patients that would come in either with an acute ankle sprain or even with tendinopathy around their ankle. And the air stirrup was an effective device because it was easy to put on and off. But I found often that these patients were also wearing foot orthoses. And when they would put, I would fit them for their air cast and then they would put, put it inside their shoe. Suddenly there was a conflict with the existing foot orthotic. And they would say to me, I guess I'll have to take my orthotic out of the shoe. And I would say, yeah, that's probably necessary, but what a shame. I don't know how we're going to make this work. And uh, I, like many practitioners, had this vision. What if we could connect an air cast stirrup to their foot orthotic? But I never took it any further until one day, um, <clears throat> and this is really one of those great accidents that happens in life, but a uh, a sales representative came to my office with a articulated sport brace that was a flat foot plate, but it articulated to stirrups uh, that looked like an air cast. And I said, boy, that's an interesting design. Um, is it possible to make that foot plate more custom contoured to the foot? And he said, well, I don't think there's any benefit to doing that. Well, why would you want to do that? And I said, well, maybe I should talk to the owner of your company. And I, uh, that company was owned by a small, it was a small company located in Southern California. And I was able to partner with that company initially with some of the design and prototype testing. And we actually shared the technology together um, and shared the licensing rights to it um, when we took it to PAL, which was a large podiatric lab to really carry forward the product development and the testing. The key was integrating the benefits of a custom semi-rigid foot orthosis with this ankle support. And um, it actually wasn't as easy as, as we thought it would be because you have to do expansions and modifications of the positive cast up and around the malleoli in a way that none of us had ever done before. 
uh, and going that high above the normal heel cup of an orthosis. So there was a lot of trial and error till we finally felt confident enough to launch the product. Um, but it wasn't, I would say it was a two year process, Ian, and uh, it definitely was born out of a necessity that I saw early in my career, but actually quite by accident, the actual idea came forward for me in a real life situation. Yeah, I love it when those accidents uh, just completely change your entire career. It hasn't happened to me yet, but I'm still I'm still waiting for my moment. Yeah. Um, for for people that haven't um, perhaps seen the brace, and I think Craig's got a picture he can pull up. And we should probably mention at this point when we talk about the Ritchie brace, we're not just talking about one brace. So could you just speak to some of the different? And we're going to come on to talk about uh, sort of certain pathologies that they're they're useful for in due course. But at the moment, could you just speak to some of the different models? that are available and, and I guess the key differences between them for those that aren't familiar. Sure. Well, you know, when I introduced quote the Richie Brace, it was the model you see on the left hand side of that screen. It was and it now is known as the standard brace. It was really designed for that patient I described earlier, an athlete with chronic ankle instability who wanted to wear a functional brace day to day or specifically during sport that would contain the foot orthosis, but also fit properly in a shoe and not be real restrictive of their uh, movement, particularly in the sagittal plane. And that's how we introduced it. It was a sports brace. Um, it was not long into the uh, product launch that podiatrists came to me and they said, hey, I put it on a patient of mine with a posterior tibial tendon rupture, and it was phenomenal the way it controlled the foot and leg. And I I actually told them I thought they were crazy. I said, that's not what it was designed for. And they said, well, you'd be surprised how well it works. And we started going back and looking at it and realizing why not? And we actually started incorporating enhancements in it like a medial heel skive, uh, flanges, uh, actual posting in the rear foot, uh, extended forefoot sulcus wedging to really try to control that severe pronatory force through the adult acquired flat foot. And, and that's when it really took off. And today, uh, I would say 80% of our prescriptions are for posterior tibial tendon dysfunction, i.e. adult acquired flat foot. About uh, six years into it, an orthotist came to me and said, have you thought about putting Tamarack hinges on your brace to use for drop foot conditions? And I said, what's a Tamarack hinge? I'd never heard of that. <laughs> he showed me. And I said, well, let's figure out how to do that. And that was a little bit more of an engineering process to mold it onto the brace with cavities and things. And lo and behold, we had a drop foot brace that was far more preferable to patients because of its low profile. And again, it's ease for fitting in a shoe. Um, and so as the years went on, we kind of responded to our input from our clinicians and we uh, came out with an enhanced version for posterior tib dysfunction, which we call the arch suspender. And then we also came out with our own version of a gauntlet style brace, which are very popular here in the States. Uh, the, the prototype is known as the Arizona AFO. And these are a solid AFO with a leather enclosure with, with laces to secure the foot and ankle into this brace and provide a much more rigid control uh, for more advanced uh, stages of adult acquired flat foot and for severe arthritic conditions of the foot and ankle. And so we kind of responded to what the industry was offering and also what our clinicians were asking us to do. So I think today we have about eight different AFO uh, braces, uh, some that are very similar to solid AFOs with some modification and then some that are simple modifications of the original standard Ritchie brace. Yeah. And we will put a link to your, your site with, so people can go there and spend more time. The one thing I've always enjoyed about your site is how much detail there is and how much guidance it gives people with regard to when perhaps to choose between the braces, depending on the, the patient or the context in front of you in clinic. So we'll make sure we link uh, to that. I love the story yeah. about you being sort of reticent or resistant to people using this for tip post pathology. When, like you say, and certainly my interpretation is that's that's the lion's share of it, or the key number one thing we tend to give it for now. And I love the fact that you came brought this to market, saying this is my sports brace. You know, almost discourage. Would you go as far to say you you were discouraging people from from using it for that pathology? Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> I love that. 
<laughs> you mean for posterior tib? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I was for a lot of reasons. I I was worried about how well an elderly patient would ambulate with a more restrictive device like this, even though uh, orthotists were prescribing much more bulky solid AFOs already. But to me, it had we hadn't gone into this uh, territory, and a, an elderly patient wearing a restrictive ankle brace uh, was a little bit uh, daunting to me in my mind until we tested it. And we actually chose a few offices with practitioners that we trusted, and we had them do kind of a pilot study. And lo and behold, we didn't have problems, and we actually had extraordinary outcome. Uh, to give me a complete about face on that perception. So let's talk um, pathologies. The, the Ritchie brace may be something that a clinician would or should consider. Um, and certainly the, the Mount Rushmore uh, of, of pathologies for the Ritchie brace for me are posterior tibial tendon dysfunction, foot drop, the two you've already mentioned, uh, rear foot, mid foot, uh, osteoarthritis, de degenerative change. And then uh, I guess chronic ankle instability, would, would they mirror your big four? Have we missed any glaring um, pathologies we should be thinking about this brace for? You know, um, I would say 15 years ago, you would be spot on with that, but I would say with the emergence of tendinopathy conditions almost being an epidemic proportion, we're seeing practitioners using it for perineal tendinopathy, tibialis anterior, uh, even Achilles, uh, which I'm not so sure the brace is that specific for. But I would say tendinopathy conditions seem to um, be more uh, uh, popular than chronic ankle instability. Uh, that, that There's a big misperception that patients with chronic ankle instability need greater mobility, more range of motion, more proprioceptive and balance training, which I agree but it doesn't mean you can't apply functional bracing to them at the same time you're going through these rehab protocols, because I think functional bracing only augments all that. It doesn't inhibit it. Unfortunately, many practitioners, particularly physios, don't see it that way. Interesting. So people are prescribing the brace uh, over a very short period of time for the for sort of tendinopathic uh, issues versus perhaps a more longer standing issue. You know, if you, if someone with a foot drop comes in, or you're probably setting expectation that this may be a part of their life for the, the foreseeable future, if not if not all of it. But what sort of timeline are people prescribing Richie braces on for tendinopathies? Yeah, that's a great question. So you hope that the tendinopathy resolves three to six months, maybe sooner. Um, I think it's worth the investment for the brace. Uh, uh, the brace is not cheap. You, uh, in the United States, it sells for upwards of seven, eight hundred dollars. Uh, so to justify that, you're, you probably are looking at a condition that requires three to six months of treatment. I would say if you think this is an early stage tendinopathy, uh, you might manage it with the more traditional methods, even a walking boot or a taping or other more temporary um, immobilization. I will point out that uh, what we've learned and what has been borne out by other research is uh, tibialis posterior dysfunction, uh, adult acquired flat foot, can uh, become more asymptomatic with long-term treatment with a Ritchie brace such that those patients also move out of their brace and are controlled with traditional or more aggressive foot orthotic therapy. Perhaps after one year of daily use, in my experience, in my own clinical experience, 50% of my patients would discard their Ritchie braids, but they would be obligated to wear appropriate footwear and more aggressive, you know, inverted uh, orthoses, um, you know, all the other tricks and bells and whistles we would employ for traditional orthotic therapy for posterior tib dysfunction. Yeah, and that's a lovely sort of link into what we, the three of us were really briefly just talking about before we went live, which is, uh, we should say it now for, for anyone listening, that, that clinical decision um, process that we all go through, and, and perhaps you could give us some insight as to how you, your, your reasoning, when we're, we're, we're trying to decide, let's say in the case of a posterior tibial tendon dysfunction, at what point should we be thinking about the brace versus when we're thinking, okay, get into a stiff, walking boot with with a, a various posted device with a big medial heel scribe. What's the tipping point? At what point do you decide this person just needs good footwear and foot orthoses versus this person would probably be a really good candidate for the brace? Great question. First of all, 
Um, we, see, we, we see posterior tib dysfunction in two clinical presentations. The first is the patient who has already been to several practitioners and is bouncing around because uh, this is a challenging condition and for whatever reason, they're not getting better. And oftentimes they already have a foot orthosis that is not adequately treating it. That's kind of a no brainer because now you can go to the Ritchie brace as the next step. But on the other hand, the patient who is being diagnosed for the first time in your clinic, who presents with a very painful swollen ankle, all the clinical signs of a collapsing progressive adult acquired flat foot, Therein becomes a challenge into how do I start and which patient is going to fail with a foot orthosis and which patient should really appropriately go right to a Ritchie brace. I would say, first of all, there's no harm in trying a foot orthosis first um, because there are some cases where I was surprised the patient actually responded very well and didn't need to go to the Ritchie brace. Even if they fail with the foot orthosis, that device could be useful nine months to 12 months down the line when they okay, they're moved to a Ritchie brace, but hopefully they're going to go back to the foot orthosis later. I would say, though, to cut to the chase, I think it's very difficult to know on the first clinical visit that which patient is going to require an AFO because often their acute symptoms preclude your ability as a clinician to really grade the severity of the condition, to stage it appropriately in stage one through three. And I often will just temporarily immobilize them with a strapping procedure, sometimes with a walking boot and sometimes with a, a, even a short leg cast, calm these symptoms down and then go through an evaluation process to see what stage they're in. And if they're in stage two deformity, meaning there's asymmetry, one foot has visibly collapsed more than the other, and they cannot do an independent toe raise on the affected foot, in my experience, they do much better going right to a Ritchie brace. If they cannot perform an independent toe raise, usually a standard foot orthotic therapy is gonna fail. So if I were to say that's the one de deciding factor, that would be it. Great. Greg, any questions on uh, Facebook before I press no, on? No, no, nothing to bring up at this stage. Yeah, Great, just okay. Few... I'm just putting myself, I'm trying to put myself in the, in the position of someone who's uh, really unfamiliar with the brace and just try to walk them through sort of uh, the journey. So in clinic, we might see, we see a patient, we may make a decision about whether we need the brace. Let's talk about uh, an assumption that we've made where we've got a patient in front of us, we are deciding, okay, we're going to try Richie brace for the first time. A um, couple of things are, when I've spoken to, to students that have shadowed me or, you know, undergrads that they, they get really, really nervous about. Um, and the first is, well, I, I don't know how to cast for it. Now, I've heard you speak about this uh, several times before, Doug. And one of the things I, I, I really enjoyed hearing you say once was, look, if you can cast for foot orthoses, you can cast for a Ritchie brace. Now, obviously, there's subtle differences, but I might ask you a, a sort of two part question. The first is, could you just explain to someone who uses Plaster of Paris, um, who regularly casts for foot orthoses, what they would have to do to cast for a Ritchie brace? Uh, and the second part to that is I know many of our colleagues have, have moved away from Plaster of Paris into uh, more sort of uh, app-based, scanning-based models of negative impression capture. Is that something that um, leads itself to, to Richie Brace prescription as well? Yeah, great question. Um, cast, you're absolutely right. If you can cast for foot orthoses or scan for foot orthoses, you can do the same for a Richie Brace. If you choose to use plaster, uh, the pictures Craig is showing there on the upper um, uh, line of pictures, you're simply going to apply a, a standard slipper cast with plaster, but in the case of the Ritchie brace, you're going to use one extra um, uh, strip of plaster and go above the top rim of that slipper cast and capture the anatomy of the lower uh, leg and ankle more specifically capture the malleoli. And so with one additional uh, four inch strip of plaster, you can go above the typical slipper cast, capture the malleoli, and now we can fabricate the brace from that cast. If you don't capture the entire shape of the malleoli, we can't make the brace. But what's really critical here is that we follow the casting process that has worked well for us for 50 years, and that is a off-weight bearing suspension cast. If, it, if ever that technique is critical, it's for posterior tip dysfunction 
and for some of these other deformities of the foot and ankle where we really want to capture accurately the, the three-dimensional contour of the plantar surface of the foot, the heel cup, uh, the shapes of the medial and lateral, lateral longitudinal arches, because with that, we're going to get a better clinical outcome. And so uh, what, what's different between a Ritchie brace and a standard AFO that most orthotists make, the orthotists go right to weight-bearing casts. And they do that because they don't apparently have much appreciation for the foot plate of the AFO. The foot plate of most orthotist fabricated AFOs looks like a flat box. It looks like a rectangular shoe box. Whereas we, that, that, or that foot plate of a Ritchie brace looks like a custom functional foot orthosis with a very deep heel cup. It has a 35 millimeter heel cup, but the arch contours and the shape of the calcaneal fat pad and all those other nuances that are so critical for control of the foot are captured in our foot plate. And we can't do that if we do a weight bearing cast. We have to cast them off weight bearing. Now with the advent of scanning, what I have seen and both in Australia and in the United States is the practitioner seems to think that positioning of the foot is no longer necessary. That all you need to do is take this scan or literally a picture of the foot with a iPad air uh, structure sensor scanner and the lab can make a perfectly fitting foot orthosis or EFO. Uh, far be it from the truth. The, the position of the foot must be uh, captured in a proper alignment to the leg either with a positioning device which uh, QOL has patented in Australia it's called the scan mate or the practitioner can hold the foot in the proper position um, and uh, correct the forefoot supinatus deformity, which dominates an adult acquired flat foot and can position the rear foot where they want and then take the scan. But you can't take the scan with the foot just hanging off the end of the exam table. You gotta position it, correct the forefoot supination. And we find it's better to have the patient lay in a prone position so the scan can capture that critical anatomy on the posterior aspect of the ankle and the malleoli. Difficult to capture that with a scan when the patient is supine because the uh, practitioner has to literally get on their hands and knees and get under to capture that calcaneus. I think that's true for foot orthoses true, uh, too. I think that we're far better off scanning the anatomy with the patient's lying prone. Yeah. yeah. Doug, I, I, I agree totally regarding the supernatus and I, with plaster, I always reach across and push down. But given the age group we're talking about, it's not necessarily possible or e even always desirable to perhaps cast it out as much as you would probably like in someone a bit younger. So I wonder if you'd comment on that. Yeah, um, <clears throat> that's a really good point. I mean, I, I have a video on my website that shows a patient where she's let, she's in a prone position and her first metatarsal or the medial column is completely dorsiflexed, probably 30 millimeters. Um, she's got literally a 30 degree four foot varus deformity, but when I push down on her first metatarsal, it reduces to zero. She has an absolutely perpendicular four foot to rear foot. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, am I really comfortable reducing that? And I will tell you, in my experience, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, I've, okay. never, um, I've never over uh, corrected that forefoot supination deformity as long as I'm not forcing it. It's just a very passive gentle plantar flexion to a very gentle end range of motion. Capture that scan in that position. I've never had it end up making a device that was either uncomfortable and conforming to the foot or more importantly, uh, not functioning properly when they walk. Uh, the question is, what do you do when the patient has a stage three and stage four deformity that is so fixed? They, have a, they actually now have a fixed four foot varus of 20 to 30 degrees, no matter how you cast it out. What's the lab going to do? Should they balance that four foot to rear foot? And I would say most of these labs, I know QOL, are reluctant to balance anything greater than 10 degrees because the patient that device is so inverted, the patient just seems to slide off it. You know, they pronate off of it. So 
Uh, that's a challenge when you have that type of patient. But in every case, you want to donate that forefoot on the rear foot as much as you can in the screening process, in my opinion. Sure. Now, I don't, I don't do this, Doug, but I know others do. What about dorsiflexing the hallux during the casting process? Yeah, that, that, that that's another way to. Uh, I, I don't. I think that's helpful when there's a minor forefoot supinatus deformity, but I don't think it's adequate in these a uh, lot like the patient that, that's on my video. Um, I also find that if you dorsiflex the hallux, it does bowstring the plaster a little bit off of the plantar surface of the foot, so you lose a little bit of that contour of your plaster or fiberglass through that critical medial arch area, mm -hmm. you know, because you get a bowstringing from the windlass activation. Now, whether that's really that critical, I don't know, but from a theoretical standpoint, I, I would rather just push down on the first metatarsal dorsal mm -hmm. and not mess around with the hallux. No, that, that's what I've always done, just reach across with my fingers and push down. That's yeah. 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 <laughs> I've got to be honest, I tend to do that just for normal foot orthoses now. It's yeah. just a standard yeah, so thing I do. Because yeah. uh, of the lab I use, you know, and, and you know, Fire, you know, Martin at Firefly, well yes. dug. And it's just yeah. something that that uh, conversation he and I had maybe 15 years ago, and I've just done it ever since. And um, it's one of the reasons I've been a bit reticent to move to scanning technology. I just, I just, just because I'm an old man, really. But um, I, I just like the control of being able to reach around and, and push down. I've always wondered where the third hand might come from. If I started to use um, uh, a scanner, can we let's go back to our our um, our, our sort of uh, inexperienced clinician with respect to the Richie brace? We've talked about sort of when they may decide to use one. We talked about sort of okay, first worry or hurdle for them is the casting. The next one uh, in my discussions with people is often the prescription form, and this is true. I think when you grab a, a load of undergrads for the first time, in, and you're just talking about you know cut normal custom made foot orthoses. They just get terrified by the looking at the form and saying, how do I know what to write? How do I know, you know, whether to write four degrees or six degrees? How do I know whether to do forefoot or rear foot, intrinsic or extrinsic? Could you put people's minds at rest with regard to if they're diving into this for the first time, they, they kind of go, OK, I'm happy to cast. Now I'm going to sit there in front of the form. What sort of learning curve are they going to find themselves on um, when writing prescriptions regularly for, for Richie braces. We'll, we'll keep the context as our posterior tibial tendon dysfunction, I think. Yeah, um, a couple points here is by all means for the new, the, the novice practitioner who's never used or inexperienced practitioner unaccustomed to using the Richie brace, please start with a patient with posterior tib dysfunction. <laughs> Don't start with a patient with sharp O deformity or post-traumatic arthritis of the foot and ankle. To start with the easiest, which is really posterior tib dysfunction, believe it or not. Um, number two, we actually tried to simplify this in a way that if you prescribe the standard Ritchie brace on the prescription form, that's all you have to do. I mean, you, uh, we already have the package built in. We have a 35 millimeter heel cup. Uh, we have a flat rear foot post on the back. Uh, we don't do any four foot posting. And it works most of the time. Uh, th there's nothing wrong with just checking the box. And that's what, believe it or not, most of our prescriptions that come in don't have anything more than checking the box standard Ritchie brace. For more experienced practitioners who know a medial heel sky always helps. Uh, I, I, I say go big or, or go home. Six millimeters or even more works really well on the Ritchie brace or a lateral sky for chronic ankle instability or severe varus deformities. Um, nothing wrong with going with that. I think when you start adding flanges and things, it gets a little more risky with uh, irritation to the foot. And keep in mind, when you have a 35 millimeter foot orthosis in the heel cup, 35 millimeter heel cup, you already naturally have flanges built in because it's a wider device and comes around the foot uh, to meet that parameter of the 35 millimeter heel cup. So, you know, there's not a lot of need to add things. Um, where we get a lot of our inquiries from clinicians is on neuromuscular conditions, uh, drop foot, and for sure on the acquired varus deformities we see of the hind foot and ankle, such as uh, Charcot-Marie tooth disease, post-stroke patients, because when you put a brace on a patient with already a varus deformity of the hind foot or ankle, it's challenging. It, it's really challenging with foot orthoses, 
But when you do it with bracing, you have you run the risk of compromising their already in place compensation for that varus deformity. I mean, we all know this from prescribing foot orthotics and the patient walks with worse varus afterward because inadvertently you've taken away their own inside compensation for that problem. So um, I, I do a lot of consultations with doctors on how to approach patients who have drop foot, weakness of the perineals, loss of the perineals with an acquired varus deformity because there we bring a lot of stuff into play. With lateral heel scythe, uh, definitely put an extended forefoot valgus sulcus wedge. I mean, we're just trying to pronate that foot out to end range of motion and then some and keep it there with the brace. And so that can be a little challenging, but um, these labs like Firefly in the UK, uh, QOL in Australia uh, are pretty seasoned now with this and they provide excellent clinical support for their clients. And, and I do as well. They'll reach out to me. I, I do uh, consults via email for practitioners in Australia and, and in the UK uh, fairly frequently. Are you, I thought you were saying you'd retired. This doesn't sound like much of a retirement to me, Doug. Well, you know, <laughs> I retired from clinical practice so I could spend more time doing this because it's, it's truly uh, rewarding to work with a colleague on a patient and see a positive outcome and, and see everybody benefit from that. So uh, this is kind of a new stage in my career that I'm really enjoying. Yeah. Awesome. I've, got a, I've got a question. So, sorry, and, uh, no, we, we, we just we just talked about you know when, when you pull the trigger and move from a inverted device into a, a, a Rishi brace. At what stage would you not? Has it gone too far for for the brace? Is is there a is there a point with it? No, look, I'm, it's that this is a surgical case. You know, is there a trigger there as well, or are you still willing to give the brace a go? Well, you know, um, I'm a trained foot and ankle surgeon and I, I did a lot of reconstructive surgery in my career. And uh, like it or not, I, I failed with, with the Ritchie brace on a certain percentage of my posterior tip patients. And I learned that if that patient wasn't improving the first six weeks after they got the brace, they probably weren't going to improve. I mean, you usually know this right out of the first visit almost, or the first visit back. These patients come in either with a big smile on their face or they say, you know, I really don't feel a lot better. Fortunately, that's not as common, but it happens. And if they're not better after three months, they usually end up going to surgery, which is disappointing, but that, that just seemed to be the way it is. On the other hand, the majority were better and continue to get better. And I found that the earliest it was worth the risk of weaning them out of the brace was six months, and usually it was nine months. I, I would have a patient totally asymptomatic, no swelling around the posterior tibial tendon, no sinus tarsi pain, ambulating perfectly in the brace, and I would say, why don't you start going without the brace for a couple hours each day, but make sure you wear your foot orthotic, which they either already had or I made for them, and if it was less than six months into this uh, treatment, they would relapse very quickly. But after eight months, nine months, a percentage of them did really well with their foot orthotic. And after a year, a lot of them did well. But we wouldn't do it cold turkey. We would do a few hours each day and then back to the brace. A few more hours, back to the brace. And it's, it's hit or miss. Uh, I wasn't always that good at figuring out who was going to succeed and who wouldn't, but it was worth a try. Yeah. Oh, on that theme of... Um... Just... Oh, go on. Sorry, Craig. Oh, it's, it's Dicko. Dicko's yeah. got a question. So I was going to say, just back backtracking to the just backtracking to the previous topic before we came onto that question. Simon's just asked this question about this, you know, how you want to really want to pronate the ref, the forefoot in these people. Um, so I'm just going to be careful with terminology here that Simon's asked, but he's really asking: Are lateral forefoot wedges more effective than a like a lateral forefoot scythe to sort of say pronate that foot or reduce that supinating foot in a Ritchie brace? So I, I, I think, yeah, I think I've got the terminology right. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I've had that question come up, and I, uh, and and this is actually outlined in a lot of detail in my book, which I know we're going to talk about in a minute. But when you pronate the forefoot on the rear foot in the casting process or scanning process, it induces a three-dimensional change 
of the entire architecture of that foot that you want to preserve in your foot orthosis and your brace. That three-dimensional rotational change and the curvatures that are assumed after that change cannot be duplicated by simply putting a lateral wedge on the orthotic to theoretically pronate the forefoot on the rear foot. That's not to say lateral wedging of the forefoot can't be a nice enhancement to do later, especially when you're not getting the results you're looking for. I find it can be a, a nice adjunct to try later uh, after the brace has been dispensed, but I don't think it's an adequate substitute for the critical positioning of the foot, twisting the foot plate, as we say, in the optimal position during this casting process. Yeah, I think what Simon, I, I know Simon well, I suspect what he's getting at is the theoretical uh, sense that you've got a longer lever arm to, ex to exert pronation moments at the forefoot than you have at the rear foot. Is that, do you think that's what he was saying, Craig? Is that is a forefoot might, might have been, yeah. Um, I was going to say, actually, just 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 while I, while I'm in this train of thought, um, we've we've hopefully given people some some ability to have confidence in saying, oh, okay, well now I, I you know if I see a, a tip post problem, uh, it comes in and they bring a bag full of foot orthoses and they've not got any success. What can I do that's different? Well, maybe the answer is the Richie brace. Maybe you're confident to say I can I can cast for this now. That isn't going to be a big drama. I think you've very much put people's minds at rest that writing a prescription for a Ritchie brace in many ways, uh, I hope I'm not crudely simplifying it, but it sounds almost more simple than writing a prescription for a foot orthosis. Right. Um, I guess the last thing I'd love people to, to, to have information wise to gel it all together are, uh, there must be certain times or certain scenarios uh, where a Ritchie brace is contraindicated, where we should be thinking, oh, this won't be a good idea. Um, could you talk us through when perhaps you know, we talk about how we should select this thing. When should we not be thinking about the Ritchie brace? What are the key contraindications? Yeah, great question. The, the first contraindication, and this came up early when we launched the brace, is everybody wanted to try it on Charcot deformity on neuropathic foot conditions. And to this day, I tell practitioners not to do that. I, I don't think the brace is, uh, I, ne I never designed the brace for that. Um, I, I get really nervous when we're putting semi-rigid devices in the shoes of patients that are completely neuropathic and have other balance issues and proprioceptive issues. Um, um, I, I, I think Charcot can be very well managed with appropriate footwear and total contact in shoe orthoses. Having said that, we have practitioners who have used the brace on uh, variations of Charcot where, where the patient also has unfortunately had a ruptured posterior tib tendon or other things. But in general, I would caution against using it on neuropathic feet, particularly on Charcot or arthropathy. Number two are the neuromuscular conditions that beyond a simple flaccid drop foot, which the Ritchie Dynamic Assist Brace works very well on, when you start moving into patients with severe spasticity, contracture, toe walkers, like for example, a patient with cerebral palsy, um, some more extreme cases of muscular dystrophy, patients who have had brain injury that are extremely spastic. I, none of our braces are adequate to address that because in most cases, these patients have proximal weakness and other issues that are more uh, uh, traditional long leg AFO to control that tibia is really critical. And so, um, I get real nervous when a practitioner starts describing patients with multi-levels of impairment of their lower extremity wanting to use a really simple Ritchie brace. The Ritchie brace is great for sagittal, the, the drop foot brace for just sagittal plane, passive hemiplegia. But when you're getting into multiple uh, conditions or, or uh, influences above the knee, uh, I, I tend to tell the patient or the practitioner to refer that patient out to a, a, a more qualified orthotist with a wider array of AFO interventions to implement. Yeah. Are there any, um, it's just a question that's only come to my mind, are there any objective measures that may be a good predictor of, of whether someone will do well? So I know we don't have many of these for, for many things we do, to be honest. So um, I think I probably know the answer, but certainly I know some people that will always look for a certain amount of, of ankle flexibility or, or calf flexibility or ankle range before they'll make certain considerations for prescribing. Are there any objective measures that your experience over the years has led you to realize, okay, people that exhibit these findings tend to do better? 
Yeah, well, for sure, with drop foot, we mandate that the practitioner measure ankle joint range of motion and, and, and assure that that patient's capable of getting to neutral, to a 90-degree foot and ankle position. Because if they passively can't get to 90, the brace can't get them there either. The brace is only capable of moving the foot and ankle within the range of motion available of that specific patient. So we would have doctors uh, prescribe a drop foot brace and not recognize the patient had a fixed equinus already in their ankle. And then the brace gets dispensed and the doctor sends it back and says, hey, it's not controlling their drop foot. They're still landing on the forefoot and the heel isn't coming down to the ground. And, and we would say, well, what's their available ankle joint range of motion? And they would say, well, I never measured it, uh, which is kind of frustrating, but that happens. Um, in terms of posterior tib dysfunction, uh, I can't really think of an objective measure that is required, but I'll tell you an interesting test. And I, I learned this from practitioners. They would say, you know, I had a patient come in. I made them foot orthoses for posterior tib dysfunction. They just weren't getting better. So what I did is I strapped their ankle uh, with a high die strapping up above. And when they walked down the, up and down in the clinic, they said, oh, my God, I feel so much better. That to me said, maybe I need to go to a Ritchie brace. And I would say, wow, that's a great diagnostic test. Yeah. And more often than not, it, they did better in the brace. So, uh, you know, connecting that foot to the leg and using that leg control is the obvious advantage of the brace over a standard foot orthotic. And you can simulate that with just temporary strapping. And what I love about that is it, it sort of mirrors the way you sort of invented this brace in the first place with the, the, the you know, the, the marriage of a, an orthosis and, a, and like you say, a, an air cast A60, like ankle brace. So that kind of works well. Um, Craig, anything else or anyone, any, any burning no, questions from any, anyone watching? No, no, no more questions, but I've sort of got one. I know Doug and I have talked about this before. It's really a terminology issue. Is it adult acquired flat foot? Is it posterior tibial tendon dysfunction? Or that, that new term that I've seen creep in the last 12 months, progressive collapsing foot deformity. Um, what really should we be calling this? <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, I, I've seen that uh, progressive collapsing foot. I, that term really disappoints me because it's so vague um, <laughs> yeah. uh, and non-descriptive, but I, I don't know what, I, I really respect the, that panel that came mm -hmm. up with all those clinical recommendations that primarily were surgical, by the way, but. That was a good group of, of uh, researchers who uh, came forward with that. Um, as you know, there was a great review paper, uh, I believe, from your Australian colleagues looking at this. Uh, uh, who was the lead author on that? Was I, I, I uh, Megan Ross. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. And uh, they said, um, yeah, the, the literature at that time has either adult acquired flat foot or posterior tib dysfunction. But really, if you look at, at the descriptions of the two, they're different. Uh, posterior tib dysfunction attributes the entire pathology to a rupture of the posterior tibial mm -hmm. tendon. Yeah. Whereas adult acquired flat foot can actually be a condition that develops with an intact posterior tibial tendon. Uh, you mm -hmm. can have an isolated rupture of the spring ligament uh, there are certain, uh, a Charcot deformity is really mm. an adult acquired flat foot in the absence of a ruptured posterior tibial tendon. So there are shortcomings to the both. I've learned this, and no matter what you try to teach, clinicians today still love using the word PTTD. I mean, they, everybody <laughs> yeah. knows what that is. Everybody has an idea of what that is. And, and I, I, instead of trying to push back the tide, I just give into it and say, Go ahead and call it PTTD, even though it has its limitations. Yeah, I think that it's. I think the only issue I have with PTTD is that it puts the pathology on the post tib tendon, and there's a hell of a lot more going on. You know, you yeah. mentioned the spring ligament. Yeah. You know, like it's it's, and I, I'm I'm sure you've seen the arguments where people have tried to suggest that the spring ligament is the primary pathology. Sure. Um, and the, the, it's just about what is the pathology we're dealing with. And I agree with you. The the new the, this progressive. Uh, collapsing foot deformity again is just as vague as a delta quad flat foot, yeah. yeah. Not to mention a touch no cebic, but we won't go there this evening. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> let's uh, if we haven't got any more questions about, about the Richie Brace, it would be a, a miss of us not to not to pump up the tires a bit on, on Doug's latest uh, 
uh, publication. Uh, he's published many things over his years, but uh, this is his new book that we're referring to, which is refer uh, which is called Pathomechanics of Common Foot Disorders. Um, available uh, as a hard copy, available as an ebook. Don't think you're narrating it on Audible just yet, are you, Doug? But um, people can get it, and here it is. Um, now, I know you mentioned uh, just before we came online that you'd retired, but for anyone that's ever tried to publish a paper in a journal and knows what an absolute saga that is, could you just give us an insight into just what a drama publishing a book is and what on earth made you realise just this close to retirement, oh, you know what I'm going to do, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull together a book? Because that, that's some task, isn't it? Uh, it, it was a, um, a task, as, as you said, far more challenging than I even envisioned. And I, about a third of the way through, uh, asked myself why I even got into <laughs> it. So, uh, as, as, as retirement approached, um, colleagues of mine who had retired uh, all uh, uh, advised me ahead of time, you're in for a bit of a shock and you should really have some things planned to keep you active and uh, keep your mind busy. And, and and I said, well, I've already decided I'm going to write a book. And that's that sounded great. And it, obviously, I, I figured that's going to fill my time nicely. But it was it was far more time than I envisioned. And uh, I made a, a, a deal with my wife. I said, I'll tell you what, I want to write this book. And I promise you, I'll spend at the most two hours a day uh, on the book. And the rest of the time is ours to go out and do whatever we do. Well, it ended up being six to eight hours a day, and about halfway <laughs> through the book, she was ready to strangle me. So um, it it was a daunting task, and instead of taking a year, it took a year and a half. And I'll be honest with you, I ended uh, the book with plantar heel pain. I really wanted to get into Achilles tendinopathy um, and Aquinas, uh, and I just said I I just can't do anymore, and I. I, in the back of my mind, I said, I'll just save that for volume two, but <laughs> volume two is not, not a good idea. Like I hope your wife's not listening because I'm, I'm certain she isn't aware of, of volume two's plans yet. Uh, and this stuff, this you know, when you're retired, writing a book is no good for your golf handicap either. You know this. No, right? not at all. Exactly. Um, <laughs> not for anything. Could you give uh, people? Could you give people a bit of an idea of the kind of thing? I mean, obviously, Craig and I have both got a copy, and we've scanned the contents. Um, could you give people a bit of an idea of, of what they can expect from this book, and then the kind of stuff that, that's within it uh, if they're considering a purchase? Yeah, the book really. Uh, the idea for the book came from uh, many of my colleagues after I gave lectures. I, it's interesting in my career. Um, I really, as I said, I was very involved with our sports medicine academy and um, uh, uh, going to sports medicine conferences. And my original papers that I published were all in the sports medicine realm. But the last, because of the Ritchie brace, I got invited to a lot of surgical conferences. And the last 15 years of my career, I gave many more lectures to surgeons, uh, podiatric surgeons and orthopedic surgeons than I did to uh, sports podiatrists. And the lectures I gave primarily focused on pathomechanics because it was an area that I felt comfortable in and an area that I knew they did not understand fully. And as I gave lectures on the pathomechanics of these common conditions they were doing surgery on, they would come up afterward and say, where can I find more of that? Or have you ever written all that out? Or is it available? Is it published anywhere? And I would tell them, no, it's a compilation of other people's work. Uh, and it's only in this lecture. And they would ask me for my lecture handout but asked me, how come you haven't written this up uh, as a compendium of everything that you've put together? And I said, well, maybe I'll do that when I retire. So that's really what how the book came about. Um, when I set out to do the book, I made a commitment that I would try to commit to evidence-based research. I wanted, no matter what I said in this book, I wanted to have it validated by fairly solid evidence. So that's why the book took so long to write, because I had to fact check everything I said as much as I could. And as you know, that's that, that's challenging because it, everything changes. Uh, uh, it's funny, the first chapter uh, I wrote uh, was on uh, Halix valgus. And a year and a half later, the volume of papers that were published on Halix valgus had almost doubled, uh, <laughs> particularly in the pathomechanics area, which was really cool. But um, the bottom line is it, it, I, I chose the most common pathologies that we treat as foot and ankle specialists, as podiatrists, and I explored 
the patho mechanics, how they got there. And as I did that, and as I developed my lectures, I found myself going back to the patho anatomy first and realized if you don't understand the anatomy here, you can't understand the patho mechanics because most of these conditions are a failure of key anatomic structures that most of us really didn't learn well in school. We kind of skipped over it because it was boring. But uh, let me tell you, and that came back to me and uh, I relearned it in a new way and learned from these anatomists uh, in such a way that I devoted the entire first chapter of the book to anatomy and comparative anatomy. That really became the foundation of the book and the foundation of each of the chapters that dealt with the specific pathologies. Lovely. So if you're a student watching, think about sending, uh, sending an order Doug's way for his book. Uh, <laughs> if you're a clinician watching, who doesn't prescribe the Ritchie brace, you know, next time someone comes in with a, with a PTTD uh, and have a bag of failed orthoses, think about, you know, think about the Ritchie brace. Um, and like I say, here in the UK, uh, we've got great support uh, from the lab that, that distributes them Firefly and, and the, the, the big cheese there. Martin's a lovely guy and super knowledgeable on the Ritchie brace. In Australia, QOL, as, as has often I've been referred to, I'm sure are, are the same. Yeah. And and it seems like Doug is. He, I mean, he's got a great website which we'll link to below. Loads of resources on the website. But um, by all means, pump his inbox. You know, the more he can. Um, he's not. You know, he's retired now, so just fire him with emails, and he'll, he'll be absolutely fine. <laughs> Actually, I'll, just, I'll get a plug in for for Canada. I think it's Paris Orthotics and Precision Orthotics in Canada. Doug. Yes. Yeah, that's, I'm great. I'm glad you did that. Paul Paris and Paris Orthotics were really my first international lab to manufacture the brace, and they've been a fantastic partner for over 20 years. What are the seven? I, I you know, the set. This is where I show that I did a tiny bit of research, but I didn't go that deep. The seven countries I referred to. We obviously got Canada, US, Australia, the UK. What what are the other three that we're missing? Well, I believe it or not, I have a lab in Spain. Uh, oh. that manufacture the brace and they distribute it in both Spain and in Portugal. Cool. And um, my Australian lab has now begun distributing the brace in Singapore. So uh, we've moved into those countries. In terms of actually fabricating the brace, uh, we have four labs, but we're in seven countries. Got you. Awesome. Perfect. So I think that's everything. Um, yeah, well, I've got, one, one, I've got one, one comment to finish on from Zoe. Excellent, guys. Thank you. I use the Ritchie Bla Brace in clinic more and more and love it. It's a game changer. So um, I think that's a that's a good note to finish on. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, so, look, so thanks very much, Doug, for those that have joined late. And I've noticed a few Australians start to come on towards the end of this. The video will be up. Well, you come back in 10, 15 minutes. The whole, the whole video will be here on YouTube. Give us a few hours. It'll be up on, um, sorry, it'll be on Facebook. In a few hours, it'll be up on YouTube. And we'll have it on our podcast um, sources soon too. So thanks a lot, Doug and Ian. Thanks, Doug. My pleasure. Thank you.